My work at UNSW Canberra concerns public leadership. And our interest in public leadership is acknowledging the common good and promoting the public interest. And really great nations consist of really great people who put front and centre the common good and the public interest. And they do that, can I suggest, because they've met people who inspire them with a vision of how they've done just that in their own lives. In other words, they've transcended narrow personal self-interest in order to think about the community of which they are a part and how in bettering that, they themselves and their own lives, in fact, may be made better. And a great people becomes a great nation, I want to suggest, because of great leadership. Those inspirational people who show us first how it might be done before imploring us to follow. Now, what keeps me awake at night? What's my version of insomnia? Well, it's this. I'm seeing declining standards of public leadership. I'm seeing deterioration in our capacity to engage as citizens of this great Commonwealth. I don't know that I need to persuade you that that is so. I want to persuade you as to what the remedy may be. But the problem, the malady, I don't think requires much explanation. That's what keeps me awake at night. It keeps me awake at night because so much of our energy is dissipated on things that actually don't matter. About infighting, about individuals more concerned for themselves than the common good and the public interest. And that's something about which I think we all should be concerned. So what is the remedy? Well, one remedy may be to look at effective leaders and create an inventory of all the things that they do. But can I suggest that's to start at the wrong place? The right place to start is actually who they are. Because before you will embrace a vision, you want to believe in the person who's putting it before you. And that requires someone who has certain characteristics that are, at least to you, ones that make you believe that what they're putting before you is also in your interests and will share, if you like, all of the things that we have in common more equitably. So what I'm going to suggest is that it's time to make humility great again. Dare I say it. But the first problem is this. The first problem is this. The whole notion of humility is misunderstood. And because it's misunderstood, it's actually maligned. Because when I talk to people about humility, what do they think it is? It's thinking poorly or lowly of yourself. When in fact, true humility isn't about that at all. It is true that the truly humble will not overstate or exaggerate their achievements and their attainments. But I want to suggest to you that true humility consists of not seeing other people in any other way than the way you see yourself. So that when another person achieves something, it's something also that brings you great satisfaction. And when they have a disappointment, then you despair as well. It's, if you like, widening your sympathy beyond yourself to others so that what matters to them, what hurts them, what deprives them of hope, actually has a bearing on you too. Now, of course, most of us understand and experience something of this when we love another person. When they're upset, we're upset. When they're happy, we're happy. But I'm talking about a broader disposition, not just those with whom we're bound in loving relationships, but also those with whom we share, if you like, the body politic. Those people with whom we share responsibilities for deciding who our leaders will be and the kind of policies that we will support at the electorate. 
So humility is something I think we need to recover. Now, you might say, yeah, but does the absence of humility make that much of a difference? Well, I want to suggest that it does. Because part of the problem in Australia, and it's a lack of humility, is that our leaders are always seeking vindication. It's our leaders have difficulty saying, I was wrong. I was in error. And it also prevents them, perhaps, from promoting someone else who may be better at the task than them, who may be more suitable than the office than they are. No, it's the office that I want and it's the challenge that I seek because it's actually about me and my affirmation. Well, that's debilitating of our public life because it puts people in the wrong places, places they shouldn't be, places they're not suited to being. And I want to suggest to you that we have people in public life at the moment who seem to be in places that don't suit the kind of person that they are. So it matters that there is a deficit of humility in our society. But then you ask me, well, how will the humble achieve anything in a self-regarding world? Won't they get trodden on? Don't they need just a little bit of ego? Well, again, can I suggest you're starting at the wrong place with the wrong question. It's not about what the individual does it's what they've become or are becoming. And those who have a sense of others as being no more or less important than themselves begin to see the world differently. Possibilities become no longer problems, but potential solutions for things we hadn't imagined, things that are held out in front of us that perhaps I might have seen in my life and I want to impart to yours when I've listened when I've shown compassion, when I've shown you all of those values and virtues that only the compassionate, only the humble can show because there's a genuine concern for the other. It really is possible, I think, for people to transform the world if they are willing to transform themselves. We can change everything about the world, but if we are untouched, then I wonder whether the change that's achieved is lasting. Now, is what I'm suggesting to you disruptive? It is. Is what I'm suggesting to you dissonant when it comes to our public life? It is. And it seems to me that sometimes some simple things need to be said about the broad direction in which people are going to say the little things do matter and how I regard myself and how I see you is foundational to the kind of society that we might create. I've gained much insight and wisdom from reading the works of Jonathan Sachs, who was the former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom. And he had this to say about humility and virtues more generally. He said, virtues may be out of fashion, but they are never out of date. The things that call attention to themselves are never never interesting for long, which is why our attention span grows shorter by the year. Humility, the polar opposite of advertisement for self, what does he say? Never fails to leave its afterglow. And I say it's both in you and in the other person. Humility isn't flashy, it doesn't announce itself. Even for the virtuous, can I suggest in places and at times it's despised. Why would you be humble? You are opening yourself to be trodden on by others. But can I put it to you, if you want to be an effective learner, if you want to be an outstanding leader, it starts with you and it might start with humility and how you see yourself and how you see others. To be both a learner and a leader. Now here's a curious thing. I have been associated with UNSW for 36 years. And not once, not on a single occasion, has anyone invited me to a lecture on humility. <laughs> and never have I seen a sign on campus for a seminar in which we talk about humility and why it might be important. 
I find that really odd. It's odd because the university wants its students and its staff to be disciplined. And yet this most fundamental virtue, this, I think, critical discipline, is one of which we show no interest and invest no effort whatsoever. I find that rather strange, that we don't see personal disciplines and principally humility as an academic enabler, making us better learners and therefore better leaders. I don't know why that is, perhaps because, as I've said, humility isn't flashy, it's not showy, it doesn't immediately reach out and grab us. We're not giving prizes at the university for those who excel in humility, like Uriah Heep and, Dr. and David Copperfield, who was so proud of his prize for humility. So what needs to change? Well, let me suggest three things in closing. The first thing is, I'm inviting you to consider how you do see yourself and others and how you understand the term humility and whether or not those things can be brought together and you might see yourself and humility differently. And actually, rather than it being a disdained and despised virtue, it's something that's alluring and appealing and something that you seek for yourself as both a learner and as a leader. The second thing that you might do as you think about leadership is not so much think about what leaders do, but think about who they are. And if humility is an important enabler of vision of the common good and the public interest, then it seems to me you might begin to see leadership as a form of service. I don't think you can strive after humility, but you can attain it, and you attain it by serving and serving others. So the leader who serves, serves the individuals, not their own self-interest, and don't seek in what they do to promote themselves above and beyond their fellows because their mother never held them closely enough when they were a child and they need adult affirmation. <laughs> I'm thinking of no one in particular. <laughs> That's the second thing. The third thing is if you have embraced humility, if you see and you feel called to leadership as service, then I don't need to persuade you that both the common good and the public interest are things that might shape your outlook and form the agenda, the vision that you might share with others. It will be self-evident. You could do no other. But we don't tend to talk much about the common good and the public interest in Australia in the context of leadership. We don't tend to talk about it in our public conversations more generally. It's assertion and counter-assertion. It's argument and disagreement. We have a program in which we ask a question, but we don't give an answer. It's really question and attack. Is perhaps a better description. And all we find better at the end is how much some things divide and how we can sometimes fear so few things unite. So I want to leave you with the thought tonight that by making humility great again, this university might decide that personal disciplines are more important than it is thought in the 36 years that I've been associated with it and promoted as something worth having. Not necessarily within and for those who receive it, but for this university's capacity to provide the leaders that this nation needs and never has the need been so great.